Okay, we are good to go. And welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I have uh, someone I just have always admired in the realm of gut issues. And today you're in for such a practical treat because we're going to talk about gastroesophageal reflux, GERD, heartburn, what's the difference. We're going to dive deep with one of the experts and talk about his new book and some really practical things that should help you if you're one of those people who suffer from this which we'll talk in a minute about statistics and how many people I'm assuming it's a lot because I see it nearly every day in my clinic. Um, if you have not caught other episodes, you can find all of my episodes on YouTube, on my channel, on iTunes under Dr. Jill Live or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And hopefully you can check all those out. We've got over a hundred interviews. Today, my guest is Dr. Stephen Sandberg-Lewis. He's been practicing naturopathic physician since his graduation from the National University of Natural Medicine in 1978. He's been a clinical and didactic professor since 1996, teaching at a variety of courses, primarily focusing on gastroenterology and GI physical medicine. And I'll just say a little side note here, um, Dr. Sandberg, you were one of the first uh, people that I really dove into SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth with. And um, it was really amazing to get all the data that you're presenting because it helped change my practice and my ability to treat patients. So you've already impacted me personally, and I'm very grateful for the way you teach and share all of your knowledge. He is a popular international lecturer at functional medicine seminars, presents webinars, and frequently interviewed about SIBO. <laughs> in 2010, he co-founded the SIBO Center at NUNM, which is one of the only four centers in the U.S. for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, treatment, education, and research. And he's author of the medical textbook on functional gastroenterology. Um, he's currently in the editing phase of Let's Be Real About Reflux. We're going to talk about that book today, and it is going to be coming out at the end of this year or early next year. So you will be able to get your copy of everything detailed about that. He lives in Portland, Oregon. I could say so much more, but welcome, Dr. Sandberg Lewis. I'm so glad to have you here. Glad to be here. Thank you. So let's start about, you didn't ask me this question, but what about statistics? Like how many people suffer from GERD or heartburn? Uh, because it's common from my perspective, but I'd love to know really how often you see it or how often it's there. Yeah, I think we all see it often, but according to statistics, up to 30% of Americans have it at least once a week. Mm. So super common, one in three, not surprising at all. Now, just for fun, do you know how that compares to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Like what percentage of people suffer from those kinds of symptoms? Yeah, well, if you figure different statistics say 10 to 20% of the population has IBS and up to 75% of them have mm -hmm. SIBO as the cause of their IBS, about 30 million Americans, and that's like, what would it come out? It depends somewhere between eight and 16%. Wow. Yeah, no surprise. I think I saw this statistic when I was studying about SIBO and IBS and the connections years ago, about one in three visits to primary care doctors were involved either reflux or symptoms of IBS, which are, you know, all the stuff we're talking about. Um, and there's can be a connection there too. We'll dive into that. Let's talk first about just the GI tract in general, just a little bit of an anatomy lesson on the pH and kind of how this works so that we can talk and dive deeper about why it's caused as, as symptoms. Yeah. So am I talking to both doctors and patients here? Yes. We have probably 80% um, consumers and, and patients and then another 20% docs. Okay. So the, the interesting thing is Many times, you, you've probably heard this, patients come in and they'll say, I know I'm way too acid, or I know I'm way too alkaline. And to me, that's a weird statement because in the GI tract, it keeps switching. So saliva, pH seven to seven and a half, mildly alkaline. Mm -hmm. And that's good because as you swallow, every minute you swallow throughout the day, it's a total of one to one and a half liters of saliva being swallowed in a day, that bathes the esophagus with slightly alkaline um, secretions that help to buffer any acid that might come up from the stomach. But then you get to the stomach, you drop to a pH of less than two, sometimes slightly less than one. Then you move through, just through into the duodenum and you go up to a pH of six and a half to seven and a half, sometimes eight. 
And that's very important to have that pH so that the pancreatic enzymes will work because they have a very narrow pH range. Then you get into the colon and with the short chain fatty acids being produced by the bacteria there, huge numbers of bacteria, you have an acid pH like 5.8 to 6.8, something like that. So it just keeps changing and it's alternating, you know, alkaline, acid alkaline acid. And to me, that feels like yin and yang, you know, the supreme pole of balance. Fascinating. And so interesting how it does change. So what are the different types of reflux? What might we see and, and where are they you know, caused? Well, the, the three main kinds of reflux, starting at the top, gastroesophageal. So reflux from the stomach into the lower esophagus, that's what most people think of as reflux. Uh, they don't think about the other two types. The next one moving down is reflux from the small intestine through the pyloric valve into the stomach. That's called bile reflux. Uh, there's more to it than just bile though, of course, because there's undigested food, partially digested food, and enzymes from the pancreas, as well as the bile. The third type of reflux is cecoilial reflux. Reflux from the large intestine, the cecum, through the ileocecal valve into the terminal ileum, the last part of the small intestine. And that's one that we generally like to call ileocecal valve syndrome. So those are the, the three main valves that reflux in the gut. Interesting, because like you said, most people are thinking of that first one and not really thinking of the others. Is it true that that ileocecal valve is a protection against SIBO and then that could be one of the causes of that um, excess bacteria in the small bowel? Yeah, it's an important way to, to divide that, you know, billions of bacteria per gram in the large intestine from the thousands yeah. in the small intestine. Yeah, I always say it's like the bacteria go up and have a party in a place they had no business being, right? It's like too much in the wrong location. Um, so what causes heartburn besides reflux? What are some other causes of the actual physical sensation of when people say heartburn? And is there an actual definition of heartburn? Like, how does that define? Heartburn is really just the sensation of burning or heat over or below the sternum, uh, substernal. And so it's easy to, to just assume that that's due to reflux from the stomach, but it can also be caused by some of the more common things. The first one is called functional heartburn. It's not actually, there's no reflux really occurring, but the heartburn is there. And no one's totally figured out exactly why that happens, but I think one of the, perhaps the most compelling things is uh, what's called sustained esophageal contractions. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the esophagus has its, its normal motility that moves things down like a chain of sausages when you swallow something. That's called primary peristalsis. But if you get some reflux or if the food gets stuck and doesn't go all the way down, you have secondary peristalsis that it will trigger more contractions. And then there's a third type, sustained contractions, which can be more intense. And they, they're abnormal, they always cause pain. So some people have that called tertiary contractions and the sustained tightness that occurs. And that, that can cause either burning or it can cause chest a feeling like chest pain. The same thing's true of distension of the esophagus. So if you eat too much or if you produce too much gas in your stomach, that comes up into your lower esophagus, and that distension of the esophagus can be perceived as either chest pain or burning. Okay. So functional heartburn, is no. there's no reflux happening. There might be gas coming up, or there might just be muscles causing pain. Um, there's also something called uh, globus phenomenon, which you all know about, and that's a sensation of a ball or fullness in the throat Sometimes that gets mistaken and just everything gets called GERD. Um, and then there's also some uh, a condition called reflux hypersensitivity. Reflux 
from the stomach to the small intestine is a normal phenomenon. It's thought in the physiology books that it happens about three times after every meal. That you're going to get some reflux, but we don't put the D on the end and call it GERD. We just call it GER, gastroesophageal ah. reflux, because it's a physiological normal phenomenon. Usually that gets buffered by the saliva and prostaglandins and other beneficial protective factors in the esophagus and the secondary contractions move it back down into the stomach. So normally you don't perceive it. You don't know it's so this there. This may be why we have that alkaline esophagus, right? Because it's kind of like the buffer. If there does get a little bit of reflux right there, it's kind of immediately alkalinized or decreased in or increased in pH or the uh, mucosal lining probably helps as well, right? That little bit of uh, uh, lining, you know, better. Right. And there is a little bit of a mucus layer, which has some bicarbonate in it as ah. well. But I just want to point out that this is one of the reasons why people with Sjogren's syndrome yes. can have such terrible heartburn because they don't have saliva to bathe their esophagus. Okay, this is fascinating because as you're talking, my thought was I have a, a question for you. It personally, years and years, I've swallowed handfuls of pills, no problem. And over the last maybe four or five years, sometimes those will get stuck in my throat. Now, granted, I probably shouldn't be swallowing 40 pills at once. Right. right. But I've never had heartburn. I don't have any esophageal issues that I know of. And my question to you is, I wonder, you know, what happens with age? I'm over 40. Is there anything with age that would make that more difficult? But then you mentioned Sjogren's and actually I don't have severe Sjogren's, but I have a little antibody inkling. I tend to have dry eyes, dry mouth. And I bet you, would you say that could be a real common if I have the early onset or early bits of Sjogren's, that might be the reason why the pills get more likely stuck in my throat than they used to? Definitely could be the cause. Interesting. So fascinating. Um, so how can this reflux now we talked about the kind of physiological reflux that usually isn't damaging, maybe doesn't even cause symptoms, but how do people end up getting esophagitis? What happens there and what are some of those causes? Yeah. So when you, when you mentioned that uh, physiological reflux doesn't cause any damage, even acid reflux may not cause any damage. Okay. So that's, that's what we call NERD, mm -hmm. non-erosive reflux disease. Okay. And that's a good 50, some say 60% of people that have an upper endoscopy who have symptoms of heartburn will have NERD, meaning they have enough protection in their esophagus from reflux that they don't develop esophagitis. They don't develop reflux esophagitis. Um, and these are people that don't respond to standard acid blocking treatments because often, well, first of all, they don't have reflux necessarily, or if they do, it's alkaline or weakly acidic. And so making their, their uh, reflux less acidic really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. In fact, it might make it worse. So this is interesting because again, clinically, I have some people who respond to betaine HCL, which is putting more acid in the stomach when their reflux is severe and it takes it away. Do you want to tell about why that might work for some people? Yeah. So, you know, I have, I have the Heidelberg machine in my office. Some doctors have it and we can directly measure the pH of the stomach. This is different than the pH impedance test that's done by gastroenterologists that's measuring the pH of the lower esophagus but it's measuring the pH of the stomach, this test that we do. And I find that about 20% of the people that I test that have heartburn have too much acid, about 20%. Another 20 to 30% make normal amounts of acid. And then the other 50 to 60% make too little. Wow. And we can actually, during the test, when we find that their acid levels are too low and, and the pH is too low, we can actually give them either bitters, bitter herbs, or betaine hydrochloride during the test. And we get a real-time reading of how does that work to bring down their pH. I just did one a week ago. The, the man's pH, just when we gave him some bicarb, it neutralized his, his pH and it just was flat for 25, 30 minutes it was not gonna come down. Usually the stomach will start, you know, the parietal cells will make more acid and bring it back down. Gave him some bitters. It did this little thing for about 10 minutes, hardly moved at all. Often that can bring it down a couple points. 
but I gave him one betaine hydrochloride capsule and nothing happened for about three minutes. And then it went right back down to where you want it at pH of 1.8. Well, so I, you can actually test and see if it's going to work for them. Gosh, if everybody had you to go to see, this is amazing. Hopefully they can read your book and get some information to help share with their doctors, because this is so, so important. It fits with clinically, like we said, what we see is you're actually saying that more people have too low stomach acid than too much. And that's like and, not typically, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and more people that have an upper endoscopy are found to have no erosive esophagitis, NERD, mm -hmm. rather than erosive esophagitis, uh, which has you know grade A through D uh, severity. And you were asking, what are the different types of reflux? So NERD, erosive esophagitis, and then the third one, uh, we really should talk about is Barrett's esophagus. Yes. And that's with chronic reflux, metaplastic changes in the, in the lining cells, the, the esophagus sort of looking for, hey, is there a better cell to protect me against all this reflux, this burning? And so it changes to a more intestinal type cell, intestinal metaplasia. And the problem of course with that is if it's more than three centimeters long, called long segment Barrett's, it does carry a slightly increased risk of developing dysplasia and then esophageal cancer. And that's especially true in men uh, rather than women. Let's briefly talk about that because there's clearly like high risk Barrett's and low risk Barrett's. What would be the big red flag risk factors if someone has this um, just plastic cells that are greater than three inches, or is it greater than three inches, maybe male greater than female, but would there be some things that we'd say these persons are higher at risk and these are lower with Barrett's itself? Yeah, the metaplastic cells um, rather than dysplastic. Thank you. Dysplastic would be the next step. Okay, so it's meta, cancer. dysplastic, and then pure, like cancerous. Okay, thank right. you. So, um, and, that, and that's why they monitor with repeat upper endoscopies uh, men, especially if they're overweight, if they smoke, if they have diabetes, because their risk is greater of developing that okay. cancer. Um, so I'm sorry, the question was. Uh, that was it, just like the higher risk factors for someone who has Barrett's, because I know that there's a little oh, bit lower risk. Of yeah. Death. So the risk factors are being male, being Caucasian, being over, over 60 years old, having diabetes. Uh, having increased abdominal fat mm -hmm. and a history of smoking. Okay. Uh, alcohol doesn't help a whole lot either, but it's not as major a factor. Okay. And are there some Barrett's, I've, I've seen a lot more in the literature where if it's low grade or smaller um, distance or that you would say you maybe don't have to, just our lower risk, what would be the lower risk for Barrett's? Yeah. So the, the least risk is when it's what's called short segment, meaning it's one to three centimeters. It's less than three centimeters long, the area that has shifted to metaplastic change. And, you know, sometimes you'll read a report and it'll say one centimeter and you think that's all right, especially if the person is female, yes. because, uh, you know, I, I went to a conference three years ago at the Mayo Clinic training on the esophagus, a whole weekend on the esophagus. Yeah nerding out on the esophagus. Yeah. And uh, that's when I learned for the first time that women don't even need to be screened. Once they, they find that they have Barrett's, they don't get retested, they don't get monitored because the, the risk of them developing dysplasia or cancer of the esophagus is so low, they don't even do that. But even better news is that there's a new thing it's not new in Europe, but it's going to be new to us called the cytosponge. Cyto oh, yes. I wanted to ask you about that because I've not. Yeah. So the cytosponge, the three different companies are making it and it hasn't quite come to market yet, but it will very soon. And it's just like the little kids toys that you can buy that are a capsule that has a sponge that's shaped yeah. like a dinosaur inside. <laughs> but instead of that, the sponge is just kind of a round globe. And it's, it's not real dense, but it's, you know, it's a sponge that will open up. It has a string, so you swallow it and the yep. string hangs out of your mouth. 
so that the capsule goes into your stomach and then dissolves in a few minutes. The, the sponge opens up. It's only about like the size of yeah. that. And then it gets pulled up. And just like a pap test, it exfoliates wow. themselves, which can then be sent to the pathologist. They can look at it under the microscope for the cellular structure. And they can also check for DNA, DNA adducts that are common in dysplasia and adenocarcinoma. Wow, that sounds so amazing and so brilliant. The design, it makes perfect sense. Like how, yeah. how did we not think of this sooner? That I'm super excited about that because years ago when I was in medical school, 20 years plus, um, the Barrett's was just like this death sentence and you had to be in PPIs. And there was so, and it was a lot of people who really didn't meet the high risk category were stuck on PPIs for their life or something. And I love that there's differentiation now um, for those patients. So let's talk about reflux treatments. How do you, what are some common treatments, some, you know, less common, like where do we go with treatment of this disorder? And um, let's go in that direction. So of course, to me, the most important treatment is treating the cause. If you know the cause and you have a treatment for it. And we have a lot of things like that. Um, so it kind of depends on the cause. And what I did in my chapter that talks about treatments is I based it on underlying cause, yeah. you know, whether it's hiatal hernia, whether it's mm -hmm. sustained contractions, whether it's delayed gastric emptying, whether it's a lower esophageal sphincter that has poor tone or a diaphragm that has poor tone that relates to the LES, the lower esophageal sphincter. So you know, I kind of set it up that way, and that's the way I think of it. So certainly if a patient has a sliding hiatal hernia, that's something that can be manually corrected. And then we teach them how to strengthen their diaphragm to help keep it in place and their abdominal muscles. And we teach them to avoid holding their breath and creating a valsalva maneuver when they lift something heavy okay. or if they bear down to have a bowel movement or if they sit up from lying down or do some kind of a core exercise. You know, so it's really important. It's nice if you can, if your patient does core exercises to ask them, show me how you do them, you know, and see if they're grunting while they're doing it or whether they're breathing. Because when you hold your breath and get a Valsalva maneuver like that, of course, it increases intra-abdominal pressure, which then tends to push the stomach up or any hernia out. So um, that's, that's important. And can we they also, learn to manually manipulate themselves or is it like a physical therapist, a visceral physical therapist that would teach them? Well, I created a technique from, I learned in 1977, an old technique, an old chiropractic technique that I used until about 14 or 15 years ago when I, after studying structural integration, I, I made a different technique that's not as chiropractic in terms of force. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's much more more uh, gentle, but there are lots of techniques out there. And anyone who does Baral therapy knows a very similar, very gentle technique. Um, in my textbook, I have a little chapter on that and show okay. how to do the correction okay. with physicians. But um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, that's an important thing. Uh, for some people, it's all about strengthening their diaphragm by doing diaphragmatic breathing, loud singing, any kind of diaphragmatic exercise. By the way, remember that if someone gets reflux after they got very constipated, say they, they say, I, I went on a trip and I didn't want to go into that outhouse out there in Indonesia. And I didn't have a bowel movement for three weeks. And when I, when I got home, I had such, I said, ever since then, ah. and that's because they got so constipated that they are creating this Valsalva maneuver, raising their intra-abdominal pressure and causing their you know, hiatal hernia to pop up. Or after birth, uh, delivering a baby, you know, when you're yeah, turning right in the face. And exactly. Um, so that's one. Um, if your problem is too little acid, hypochlorhydria, you know, there's lots of nice treatments for that, whether it's betaine hydrochloride or vinegar before meals, one or two teaspoons in water or, uh, or bitter herbs. Uh, and of course, with any of these things, I like to investigate how well the vagus nerve is working 
by looking at their palatal rise when they say ah. Mm -hmm. And you want to see a nice, if this is the uvula hanging down and these are the palatal arches, the tongue down here. When the person says ah, you want to see ah, 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 like that. You don't want to see ah yeah. or ah, and you no. don't want to see ah, that kind of thing. That sluggish palatal rise is a sign that the vagus nerve isn't firing properly. And then you're never going to get the digestion right. So there are lots of good exercises to tone that. Um, if the person actually makes too much acid, the treatments are different. And probably melatonin is going to be a really important piece there. Uh, because melatonin has been shown to help protect the lower esophagus from bile, Mm -hmm. acid and pepsin and they've done studies where they in rats where they actually drip bile pepsin and acid into their lower esophagus for two hours at a time and one group gets melatonin first and the other group doesn't and the melatonin group is protected from the erosive esophagitis that develops oh. lots of other mechanisms uh, you know things that you can do to help protect and on melatonin, let's just pause there. Is it like, I mean, there's such a range of doses physiologically from 0.2 to 20. What kind of a dose would you maybe start someone who was trying melatonin for that? Unless they're one of those people that really responds great to one milligram or a half a milligram, usually somewhere between three and six. Okay. Yep. And remember, melatonin is part of that GI clock. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the light and dark sequences in our environment trigger melatonin excess during the night. And I think of, I like to tell patients, melatonin puts your digestive tract to bed. Ah. And then, you know, serotonin and motilin do the work during the day. Um, but there's this really important piece in that if someone works, you know, graveyard shift, or if they have really bright lights like we have on right now, but they, it's after the sun goes down every night, or they're, working on a computer that's turned up totally bright and right until they go to sleep or they're flicking their phone in uh -huh. bed, that's yeah. really going to affect their GI clock. Yeah. Yeah. So there are just, there's so many ways to, so many ways to mess up your digestion. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of telling people to do, you know, after 7 PM or so do red lights only or not do, I mean, granted you can have the household lights if they're not the full spectrum, but those bright lights and the screens really, really do affect not only the quality of our sleep, our deep sleep, our heart, our, uh, our physiology of the gut and everything. It's so important to mention that. Um, this is, yeah, I could go into a bunch of other treatments, but I don't know how much you want to go. Into. I do. I want to go to, and I would definitely want to talk about lifestyle things. Is there anything else as far as, um, do you often uh, conventionally they're given a PPI, which is not wrong, but you said 20 to 30% is excessive acid and the rest are other causes. Do you still, obviously you have a clinic where you can diagnose and say exactly what's going on. The average physician maybe doesn't have that. Is it still worth a trial of PPI or how do you feel about that? Is there other things that should be done first? According to a study that was done, a, a PPI trial is the wrong treatment about 37% of the time. So about a third of the time, you know, I guess that's a good, that's a good test, right? Because if you, if you looked at research and they said, this test works 66% of the time, yeah, you know, 63% of the time, oh, well, that's a pretty good test. Um, but, you know, I, I I like to be a little more educated about it, but that's what most physicians are going to do a PPI trial. Um, and I guess there's no harm in that because if you do it for a short period of time and you get a dramatic, dramatic night and day change in your heartburn, it's gone. Yeah. That's pretty good information. If you get no change, that's pretty good information. And if you get worse, to me, that's pretty good information too. You know, they probably have NERD or functional uh, heartburn or some other condition going on. Um, so, um, yeah, PPI trial. You go either, um, it makes sense in some ways, but yeah, I kind of think of, of a PPI trial as sort of a test yeah. as opposed to, oh, we're going to give you this and then you'll just stay on it if right. it helps you forever. Um, and by the way, um, turmeric, curcumin is a big one too for 
protecting the esophagus. In fact, there's good research that shows that it can be used to help normalize the metaplasia in the lower esophagus with Barrett's. Uh, now that's interesting because I do the same thing with HPV in women. It's totally different, but it's metaplasia, dysplasia in, in a woman. We use turmeric the same way. We use topical. So it makes sense on all these layers on the mucosal lining. Yeah. And if, and if turmeric really is poorly absorbed from the gut, all the better. Because yeah. if they reflux it back into their lower esophagus four or five times before it leaves the stomach, they're getting a lot of bathing there. Yeah. Wow. I love that. So say we have a person who does respond to PPIs and uh, we don't want them on lifetime. What other lifestyle or natural treatments would you do for the person with high stomach acid? And then maybe let's go to the other types of reflux as well. So with, with high stomach acid, you might consider an H2 receptor antagonist if it's needed. And uh, nowadays, mostly pantoprazole, uh, excuse me, uh, famotidine. Um, you also would consider DGL because if you reflux the DGL, that has been shown to protect the esophagus too against damage, against reflux esophagitis. Um, and, and again, that's the interesting thing about reflux is it, it moves the medicine up from the stomach into the lower esophagus where you want it. Uh -huh. So kind of works nicely that way. Also, uh, with, with Barrett's, uh, if they end up having Barrett's and they have too much acid, uh, you also have vitamin C, vitamin A, and zinc, especially carnosine. Uh, aloe vera has been shown to be a helpful demulsant as well as the DGL. But the, you know, the curcumin or, or turmeric is a big one. And selenium has shown some benefit as well at normalizing it. Um, but again, if they have a hiatal hernia, you're gonna correct that. You know, if they have poor lower esophageal sphincter tone, you're gonna work on that. If they have gastroparesis or delayed gastric emptying, you're gonna help the stomach empty properly. So you know, if you have a full bag of food and liquid, it's much more likely to go up the top if it can't come out the bottom. Let's talk about gastroparesis just briefly. I've used a German product called a Birogast. I love that one. What other things would you use for gastroparesis? Because I see that a lot with chronic infections and things that affect the vagus nerve. And um, what would, you, uh, would your approach be to, to gastroparesis in general in lifestyle and natural approaches? Yeah. Besides, Iberogast is great. In fact, it was compared to metoclopramide, uh -huh. uh, very kind of dangerous uh, that, yes. Prokinetic, and it worked just as well in one trial. Um, in other trials, it worked slightly less well, but I, I certainly find it's a good one. Um, ginger is probably the simplest prokinetic, uh, whether it's a tea or capsules or in food. Um, you know, ginger, that's why it helps with nausea because it helps the stomach empty sooner, one of the reasons. Um, other things to consider are other prokinetics uh, besides those two uh, things that help the stomach empty. The prescription one, of course, is erythromycin at 50 milligram potency. Um, you know, standard erythromycin, which isn't used for much anymore. Uh, zithromycin is used instead, but standard uh, erythromycin is 250 milligram tablets. So we either have the patient cut the tablet in four parts with a pill cutter and take quarter of a tablet at bedtime, sometimes also before meals. It's a motilin receptor agonist. So it actually helps that whole migrating motor complex, emptying the stomach and moving things through the small intestine, decongesting the upper GI tract. Um, that's a good one. Um, there's also a combination of ginger with artichoke, uh, one particular product that Several companies make that now, and that's perhaps a little bit more effective than just ginger by itself. I just started using that, and I really like because, like you said, a couple of companies make that and had real good results besides just ginger. So I love that. Just one thought that I've I've seen used in um, and I've used before with much more the migrating motor complex lower when there's SIBO. But any thoughts on low dose naltrexone? Could that help in this case, or is that more of a? Do you think there's any place for that? Yeah, low dose naltrexone 
definitely seems to have at least a mild prokinetic activity. And I tend to use it together with another prokinetic herbal or prescription when someone has post-infectious IBS yeah. or other autoimmune causes of gastroparesis or something like that. So, you know, you can, you can measure, uh, you can test for post-infectious IBS with the um, IBS smart uh, yes. test that measures the antibodies that come on with uh, infectious diarrhea and other food poisonings and see if the person's carrying that sort of autoimmune response that's causing their uh, post-infectious IBS. I tend to use LDN fish oil, get their vitamin D into normal range, and then also use a prokinetic, whether it be herbal or prescription. And by the way, procalipride is a wonderful prokinetic as well. Totally agree. That's a, my favorite. When everything else fails, <laughs> for calibrate it is, and it it yeah. really really works. One just side note here, because we're using um, obviously proton pump inhibitors and uh, histamine blockers. Um, I have seen the connection when someone has a mold exposure or mast cell activation, where histamine is a big trigger. How does that fit into what you're talking about as histamine as a cause or as a part of everything else we said? Because I see that as a once in a while, I'll see people who go into a moldy environment. And the one symptom they have is heartburn because of that histamine. Any thoughts on the histamine connection? Yeah. You know, as I was finishing my book, I was thinking I should put a chapter in on histamine, <laughs> but the next version, uh, next sure. edition, I'll do that. Um, but you know, it makes total sense that since there are histamine H2 receptors on the parietal cell that trigger acid production, you know, there's three different triggers, acetylcholine, gastrin, or histamine. And so if histamine can trigger acid production, why wouldn't it be a factor for a risk factor for reflux in some people that especially have histodelia yeah. uh, or just mast cell activation that just sets off at very little provocation. Well, I love that because you just explained, I knew this happened, but I wasn't sure of the why. You just put in, in line exactly why that happened. So that's super helpful. I'm sure. Well, also, I, I should just mention that there is there are several articles that really prove that reflux isn't just a burn. It's not a it's not an acid burn or an alkaline burn. But what it really is, is an inflammatory response to those secretions. Okay. And maybe that could explain why you can have heartburn, even though you have no erosion or anything. Uh, but there's a mild, at least sub uh, cellular inflammatory response, or maybe even a cellular, you know, notable inflammatory response with, with erosion. But uh, th there's good evidence that just even something like take turmeric then. Turmeric is really good at reducing TNF alpha and interleukin 1B. So if it could really calm down the inflammation, it could work on that as well. Interesting. And then that makes me think about like quercetin or Chinese skull cap or some of these kind of muscle. I wonder how they probably play a little role too for those people who are histamine driven. Um, let's kind of end with the lifestyle part, like food and lifestyle things where they're a little bit more practical for day to day or what people could do. And again, it probably depends on cause, but do you want to go through a little bit of the lifestyle things people could put into place to maybe reduce their risk of heartburn? Yeah. And I, and I should say that again, the Townsend newsletter, uh, the, the journal that came out. In Let me hold that up because I just got this and I literally pulled it out. So if you follow Townsend. Yeah. So I was like, I, oh, I have an interview next week and I got it in the mail last week. So it was perfect timing. What I did was, uh, we didn't plan that. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, what I did was I, I sort of sneak peeked a chapter, which I thought was one of the most amazing chapters. And that's the one on lifestyle. Yeah. And so it's in there. The whole chapter's in there. But I created a mnemonic, uh, which is called Reduce Carbs, Reduce Reflux. Yeah. And so carbs, C-A-R-B-S, is a mnemonic for the factors. So C stands for cigarettes, coffee, chocolate, and cola or other soda, you know, soda drinks. Um, and this doesn't mean that for every person, they have to cut out all of these things. But any one of those things could be an issue. And I talk more about the details in the, in the chapter. 
and the research behind it. A, we're on carbs, A is for alcohol, which could be a factor for a lot of people. Aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And acids, because for some people, acidic foods are a factor. Um, R in carbs is for refined carbohydrates, but really it's about too much carbohydrate in general, any type, even if it's unrefined. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, R is also for RX or prescriptions, because mm -hmm. there's a whole giant list of prescriptions that either aggravate reflux or can cause it. Um, and then also R is for rapid eating. Mm -hmm. So shoveling your food, yes. triggering a fight or flight response when you really need a rest and digest parasympathetic response. Um, B in carbs is for big meals. So overeating, which is really going to be a, a negative factor if you have delayed gastric emptying. Big waist circumference. So people who have apple fat have an increased risk of reflux. That's been well proven. And that's true, like I said, with Barrett's as well. And I also used B for bedtime eating. So eating within three hours of lying down, you know, to go to sleep is a, is a big factor. S, the last one in carbs, is S is for snacking. And that was really interesting. The research shows snacking either helps or mm -hmm. hinders reflux. Wow. And I think it depends what you snack on exactly. <laughs> and how much you eat on during the snack. Uh, the second S is sleep position. And, you know, sleeping on the left side is the best position because it puts the stomach in this kind of position instead of this kind of position, which can dump into the yeah. esophagus. So sleeping on the right is the worst and sleeping with a wedge mm -hmm. so that you're elevated or putting something under the, the foot, uh, the feet of the headboard to raise the top of the bed um, is definitely proven to reduce reflux. And then S also stands for spicy food, which also goes both ways. Yeah. Um, so some studies found that regular use of cayenne and other chili peppers actually reduced reflux if you used it a little bit all the time. Mm -hmm. But occasional use of certain spices can increase reflux. And uh, I think that really depends on the person and the spice. And then the last one would be specific foods. So, you know, people can have food sensitivities and intolerances, mm -hmm. and those have definitely been shown to one of the symptoms they can cause is reflux or heartburn. Super practical. I love the acronym and it includes so many things, easy to remember. Um, and that's in the chapter of your book, the Let's Be Real About Reflux. Chapter in the book and in the Townsend article. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll be sure and uh, link these all up. So um, what a wonderful wealth of information. We have covered so much. Um, where can people get a copy of your book? You said it's going to be out either end of December, early January. Where can people find you and find your book? Yeah. So I'm at hivemindmedicine.com. You know, you can look at our website, hivemindmedicine.com. Uh, and I have blog posts and, you know, lots of information there. Um, and actually, if you put Stephen Sandberg Lewis in Google, you'll find me. But because um, I, I have a lot of hits. But uh, in terms of the book, the book will be available through Amazon and all major booksellers. If you go online or you know, go online for any major bookseller, you'll be able to find it. Let's be real about reflux, getting to the heart of heartburn. Fantastic. Such a wealth of knowledge. Thank you for all the wonderful research, knowledge, and information you bring to our field. Thank you for your time today. Um, greatly, greatly appreciate all that you shared.